thank you really for having me. I mean, it's every time, you know, when I, I've never been to Estonia, I've been to other countries around here, but not to Estonia. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's always unbelievably important to be able to come to a place and to, to keep on traveling and to keep on doing things and not just sit in the library and go through JSTOR and, you know, Academia EDU and things like that. All right. So, um, also I realized I was invited, of course, as a comparatist, uh, since I don't work on Eastern European art and I didn't reinvent myself as an Eastern Europeanist, although I've been um, uh, supervising, well, one a student of mine is here today, who's just uh, become a doctor, uh, Nicola Drossos, so I'm learning from my students, of course, uh, this point a lot. Uh, and in fact, I myself don't work right now on this, you know, often you're invited to talk about something that you've already done. So my talk today will have two parts. One part has a little bit to do with something I've already said, but I'm going to revisit it in a different way, because here I want to contextualize it to do the 50s vis-a-vis -vis the 60s. Uh, and so some of it has a little bit to do with something I did in Mural Nomad, except that I added an example that I didn't do there. And then the other one comes from a chapter of this book I'm finishing now on Italy in the 60s. And it's, um, you'll see the theme, I've pushed that theme uh, closer to synthesis so that it's somehow the two are pendants to one another. Also, although I end in 69. I mean, really, I'm focusing on the 50s, first half, and then the 60s, a late 60s, with a gap in the, between the two. Uh, I wanted to do it because I realized that I think, I haven't heard the papers, I've only read, you know, the little bits, the descriptions, but that I hope I will address from this West European point of view, but and mostly from Italy, some of the issues that you will be discussing and we'll see if there are convergences so that it's not always East versus West. Uh, the East is very particular, but at the same time, I think, or oh, you'll decide, we'll see if there are more convergences. Um, all right, so, um, all right. So as I said, yes, mostly an Italian perspective. Uh, even though this conference is directed towards Eastern Europe. Uh, some of the themes which I hope might be relevant uh, to all of us here is, what does it mean for a country whose investment in the concept of synthesis of the arts and architecture was identified with the ideology of a totalitarian regime to want to disinvest from it, or thus to undo synthesis, uh, which is really what Italy is doing in the 50s vis-a-vis -vis fascism. It was really one of the keystones of the fascist regime. So that's one thing. So there is always a very strong ideological and political component to synthesis. And I think it's particularly, as we know, strong in Eastern Europe. It's also very strong in Italy. It's less strong in France, for instance, or in other places. Uh, also, what does it mean to us, which is what we'll look in the first half of this talk, to refurbish and repurpose iconic buildings and urban spaces with a charged ideological past through, again, a new way of doing synthesis. Um, actually, this is also true for my 68 moment. Another question would be, can we really, in fact, establish a relation between the 50s synthesis moment and the intertwinement of the arts after 1959, when contemporary art practices became oriented towards the dematerialization of the art object? And the extra mural trespassing of the artifact into its surrounding. So I'm not sure, actually. I think they're connected, but I'm not sure they're so connected. So that's, for me, still an open question. Even though I'm looking at the way synthesis was undone in the 50s, it's not undone in the same way as it is undone in the aftermath of 68. Another question could be, uh, yes, so there are many forms in which synthesis uh, is being undone, since that's the term I used. There is tectonic integration versus dislocation. There is uh, what I learned from Nicola, this idea of the monumental decorative, let's say, to use a Soviet term, uh, as a form of masking, which I think is, there is a kind of monumental decorative in Italy too. It's a kind of an oxymoron. I don't know what the monumental, we will look at some monumental decorative at the beginning because the decorative, in a way, is diminutive, the monumental, so it's micro, macro, the micro, ma uh, masking something about the macro. That's one thing, so masking. 
Uh, and this will take me to the logic of the paragon uh, in uh, Jacques Derrida, and I'll talk about it for a few minutes later. Then there is the question of whether, as I said, is there parallels between Eastern, in Eastern Europe of something that I became interested in in Italy, which is the question of nonlinear temporalities. Flashback is my model and eclipse. These are my two. They're both spatial and temporal models. I chose the 60s because all my students are working on the 60s. It's is like become 60s, 70s, 80s. That's what everybody's working on. But they're working on it in a very present way and I wanted to work on it in a non-presentist way and so uh, that's why you know, kind of a slightly Warburgian way perhaps uh, so that's why the flashback uh, and the eclipse are interesting for me and you'll see it in the second half of the talk and then finally this question of yes of periodization are there historical non-synchronicities of course there are major historical non-synchronicities between east and west yes 1989 uh, and just to mention one uh, but this morning when i was meeting students i mean we're talking about a whole different periodization right in the east uh, and uh, at, at the same time i think that some things are chronologically aligned so once we set the differences it's also interesting to see if there are some alignments, not just these alignments. And then finally, questions of ideological continuities and rupture. You know, the Foucauldian approach is to overemphasize, I mean, to emphasize rupture. And that's been in my country, or if you call America my country, whatever, my professional country, the approach of, let's say, October, uh, the group of art historians that very much dominates uh, art history, as well as Grey Room. It's all about rupture. And it's all about very much emphasizing rupture and the avant-garde. Well, in fact, I'm also interested in continuities, and as I said, in non-synchronicities. So um, that's, uh, so the rupture is, um, I'm not sure I believe completely in ruptures. Okay, so as I said, I will look at two moments today. I hope that you don't feel that the lecture is just one and then a second disconnect because as I said I think there's a reason or I created you know as an art historian you you fabricate these things so I now fabricated in a way those two moments as complementary uh, to one another or they're opposed but complementary so first will be the post-war post-fascist years of reconstruction and democratization or re-democratization in Italy under the Christian Democrats center right government Catholic, uh, from 51 to 59. And then the second moment will be the revisiting of the historically fraught legacy of the synthesis of the arts at the aftermath of the student movement of 1968. Because in fact, from 68, 69, my book actually ends up in 70, although today I will look at a 69 moment, there is suddenly a re-emergence. And I think it comes truly, it's a generational thing. But this question of the politics of synthesis under fascism and also just after become relevant again. And I'm not sure they're relevant, let's say, from 59 to 68. There, there are moments when, but, but again, maybe a lot of your papers will be in the early 60s and we will see that what I'm saying is not relevant chronologically to other uh, places you're looking at. Okay, so let me, yeah, oh my God, immense. All right, <laughs> talk about monumental. Yes, it's monumental. So, okay, so I'm starting. Another thing is that uh, I guess we all look at this. I look also at uh, things in magazines. So, in fact, we have double spreads of something which is about the monumental, but it's in magazines. And we're more and more interested right now, right, in how things are mediated through uh, magazines and not only magazines. So I start with this uh, double spread from Domus, the uh, architecture, design, and art magazine, uh, which really dominates the history of Italian Italian art. I, in a way, I believe you could tell the whole history of Italian art from 1928 until today just by flicking through Domus. My husband, who's also an art historian, was horrified because at some point I, I said, you know, what, we were talking about this new book of mine, and I said, well, my main source is Domus. I just flicked through Domus. And he said, oh, well, but that's an archive? And I said, well, yes, in a way, yes, it is an archive. So Domus is important to me also because it is about art architecture and design. Uh, the three, more than Casabella, which is mostly architecture. Uh, and it's interesting actually that Domus art in it, and I won't look at this at all in this course, but you should know it's like always squeezed between architecture and design. It's a slim 
I don't even know exactly how it is now, but let's say in the 50s and 60s, and in the 30s as well, it's a slim portion in black and white photographs. So everything is in color, but art is in black and white. It's reversed, and that is very interesting. And I became interested in it in terms of flashbacks, because the black and white, as Roland Barthes and others say, when you look at black and white photographs, it produces, in a way, mentally, the you know this idea of wanting to revisit earlier periods. But OK, here we start. Joe Ponti is an architect. He's one, the chief editor of this publication. And also, this is a publication that continues it never misses a beat. It continues through fascism and after fascism. So this is continuity. Even though when you go around Italian libraries, you find it very hard to find the years 43, 44. But in fact, uh, Domus continued undisturbed uh, through uh, fascism, post-fascism, the resistance, uh, you name it. OK. So what does he do? In this uh, year, an article of 1951, which is really, in a way, the beginning of discourse on reconstruction, when you could really start to actually rebuild. He says in this article, yesterday's and today's monumenti di ieri e oggi, right? Yesterday's and today's monuments. Uh, he, he, he argues that the Colosseum has aura because it is a ruin and because it has been turned into a pure object of propaganda by uh, isolamenti, which is Mussolini's archaeological isolations of monuments, uh, uh, Roman monuments, to a pristine state. But he says, he reminds us, originally, of course, the Colosseum was an utilitarian building, just as the about-to-be-completed Termini train station, which he has on the other side. And he says, and moreover, uh, it's small compared to the monuments of today. So there are two things, obviously, that he's starting, that he's trying to do. I mean, the two um, strategies that work here. It's a post-fascist text that is aimed to deflate the role of the Ro Roman monument and also to reinvent the idea of the monument, the urban monument, in line with the argument made in the famous position paper entitled Nine Points on Monumentality, co-written by uh, the French painter Fernand Léger, the Spanish architect José Luis Sert, and the Swiss architecture historian Siegfried Gideon during the war in 1943 in America. Well, the three of them are in exile. And as you know, this was then discussed many times in the early uh, Siam uh, meetings. This was a call to redeem monumentality by recasting it for the context of a modern democratic public sphere that was, that envisaged, um, that was envisaged for architecture after the war, how to reinvent the public sphere. It called for the reorganization of community life around great modern civic centers, urban ensembles, and public spectacles, and this on a scale that implies the collaboration of architects, planners, and artists. In this particular case here today, now I will look at how it assigned a particular role to the synthesis of the arts, that is the intervention of a painter or sculpture as a way of humanizing uh, monumentality. And Léger, of course, was interested in it already in the 30s in France. And because he was a good lefty artist, he you know, could have a voice uh, after World War II. Then there is another quote one could have, and here I have no illustration, but it's equally symptomatic of the protagonists of the zero hour. Italy has, and yes, of course, rupture is itself in, um, you can say, an ideological construct. There is this idea in Italy by artists who were fascists, or some of them were not fascists, but almost all of them were, who become communists after World War II. There is a very strong communist party in Italy. And so they are those vocal protagonists of the idea of the zero hour. You have it in Italy, you have it in Germany. The zero hour, although in Italy it's more left and right, so you go, you switch overnight, almost overnight, from right to left, and you argue for the zero hour. What does the zero hour say? Fascism was a parenthesis in Italy. Uh, we were a democratic country, we're again a democratic country, and on the other hand, so that would be continuity, but what they really say is that you can start all over, you uh, turn, you reset the clock, right, in 1945. So for instance, an uh, abstract artist here called Piero Dorazio, he writes another article in 52, but it's like 51, 52, same moment. Verso la sintesi delle arti plastiche, towards a synthesis of the arts. Um, 
And I quote, he says, we're building a new civilization for a new society. Painters and sculptors have to intervene in reality, which is the overall problem of architecture, the urbanism of the new cities, the new neighborhoods, the new factories. It is a collective activity, a program for total reconstruction. It is not a question of finding a remedy to uh, a supposed lack in architecture. Uh, the modern uh, artist has to, uh, you know, okay, so, so we will deal, so in a way, uh, synthesis for him becomes something that is gonna happen in the new neighborhoods, the new factories, uh, and um, basically, um, well, again, rehumanize um, architecture. So you have this both, coming from Joe Ponti, who is not a particularly uh, politicized artist, and then from more politicized ones. This article by Dorazio was published in a magazine called Arti Visive in 1952 in an issue that immediately uh, followed uh, the issue that translated in French, uh, in Italian, sorry, from the French, a text by Le Corbusier, entitled Le Rapport des Arts Entre Eux, Synthèse des Arts Plastiques. Again, same thing, the connection of the arts between, you know, among the interconnection of the arts and the plastic arts. And this was a speech that Le Corbusier delivered in Venice in 1952 on the occasion of a symposium sponsored by UNESCO. So another thing that, as you know, UNESCO, you have all these symposia after World War II, UNESCO, which is also decorated during those years by a number of artists and architects in terms of synthesis, is key. And this conference took place in Venice at the same time as the Venice Biennale, or just at the end of the Venice Biennale, when the Venice Biennale was about to close. And we have to understand conferences like this also as part of a process of defascistization, defascistization, all right? So conferences are important too, and as you know, today we're looking more and more at Acts of conferences. Okay, this lecture now will take me to three cities, Rome and Milan in the first half, and then a smaller city called Como, uh, you know, near Milan, uh, smaller than Tallinn. I was hoping at some point that they could say that they're the same size, but they're not. Como is smaller. Como is like uh, 200,000, uh, even less, 150,000 uh, inhabitants. But I when I was walking through Tallinn, uh, of course, I was thinking of how those artists, as we will see, take over in the series of happenings, the center of that city of Como. All right, but let's start with Rome. This is Rome, okay, big monuments, and thus the place where the desire to undo synthesis, to ironize it, as we will see through decoration, is really the most pressing. Because why? Obviously, it's the capital and it's the showplace of Mussolini's regime. And it's also the place where everything remains. Synthesis remains a thing that pertains to the monumental in Rome. So let's look here, uh, you know, to uh, fronts. It's interesting because I'm interested in how these added parts, which as you'll see have decoration inside, I will move then to the decoration, are also fronts, they're masks, to a fascist building behind it, and fascist buildings which are repurposed, right? So uh, this was a station that was built for the 1942 World Fair uh, by Mussolini, I mean Mussolini, as you know, built Eur, which was still exists as the third Rome, uh, and it was built in 42, but unfinished. And we will see how they add the structure in the front, they decorate it, as I'll show you in a minute, as a front. And the front meaning really as a mask to the big uh, neoclassical uh, structure rationalist, neoclassical behind it. Same thing happens with FAO. FAO, uh, you know, is the center, it belongs to the United Nations, it's along with UNESCO, it's the Center of Food Administration, and FAO, you know, all these acronyms, very typical of the 50s and the Cold War. And again, a huge building in which in front they add a section which will have inside, as we will see, they both have these semi-detached decorated ceilings and, uh, and all of this really in the early 50s. So okay, so let's start by looking at Termini. Um, so Termini here, you see the three bodies, right? So it starts with the, the so the, the building of the 30s basically, uh, which is gonna be completed later, okay? Uh, it starts with Angelo Mazzoni. You see you have one architect who actually built a lot of uh, decorated post offices, which I worked on all over Italy. And then the second part, that part, 
part there is an international competition, yes, won by Italians. Another thing that you notice is that you have always like five or six architects, many of them much lesser known than uh, before. It's in a way, I think post-World War II is the end for a moment of this kind of heroic moment for architecture. So you have these names, uh, you know, a firm with five different names. So we have 37, its first moment, and 57, uh, uh, 53, its second moment, where they add this part here, which had remained incompleted, uh, uncompleted, right? And then they add, in particular, this particular thing, which was reproduced in every, every, every magazine, um, architecture magazine in the 50s. This extraordinary S shape, uh, which is this canopy, it's suspended, it's cantilevered, it's the arrival departures, right, the large entryway entirely eased, uh, while everything else, of course, is stone and the travertine standing for fascism and the, okay. So this is what we have. What interests me is that little pensilina, that little thing that hangs in the front of it. So I go all the way to the edge, like, like a diver, uh, and I'm looking at this at the end of this immense uh, cantilevered canopy uh, at the entrance, uh, we have this uh, thing there that hangs, uh, built, uh, designed by a sculptor who in fact was born in Hungary, Amerigo Tot is his name. He studied in Budapest. He has another name in Hungarian. I won't even dare to pronounce the Hungarian name, so let's keep it to Amer <laughs> Hungarian is the hardest language, I think even harder probably than Finnish and then Estonian. So his name in Italy is Amerigo Tot. He arrives uh, in Italy in the, th in the um, he studied first in Budapest and then in uh, the Bauhaus and in 33 he comes to Italy. And what is interesting, and all of them have to have that moment, if possible, is that he's also in the Italian Italian resistance in 1943. And what does he add? These large bolts, right? This thing is bolted, and you can see it's kind of semi-detached, added this little frieze at the front. So one could say, you know, why? You have this enormous building. Why are you looking at this kind of marginal thing? In fact, again, if we will look at this idea of the paragon, which I'll again discuss in greater detail in a few minutes, you're looking at a detail which, in a way, is ideologically very telling about the main body of the work. And that is that you have these large bolts gleaming in anodized aluminum. And aluminum, of course, is this, it, it's abstract, it's dematerialized by being in aluminum, it's, it's the riveted plates that, 4,000 plates that are hung together uh, precariously. And the idea is to emphasize this idea of precariousness. Um, one of the poet critics writing in Italy at the time called Emilio Villa, he mused in 1954 about incoming travelers to the Termini uh, station being, I quote, greeted by heraldic signs, ideographs, lost scriptures, emerging from a distant past, still awaiting to be deciphered. So there is this interest in undecipherability, all these kind of the trope. It's a trope, this idea that you're going to look at these signs and that, uh, you know, that signs that are coming to you in a futurist way, but from an... Uh, distant past. And of course, we have to also to understand always pre and after. And so abstraction is the present. It's the after. Every decoration that we're going to be looking at, uh, and I use the word decoration. I mean, this is decoration. Uh, and it also uh, calls itself decoration by being semi-detached, is always abstract, right? It's pittura informale, art informel, spazialista, nucleare. There's all these groups of um, artists who uh, want to participate, even though there are not so many examples, I should say, of synthesis of the arts. I'm looking here at some. Uh, there are not hundreds of them. I mean, there you can count them on let's say there must be maybe 20 or 30. But they're always uh, by these abstract artists who had a short career either during the war or even a little bit before and mainly their career in the 50s. Okay, let's look now at the other one, Fao. So, okay, so if this, what is interesting also is that they're always next to ruins. This is, of course, near the uh, Circo Massimo. Uh, I was born in the second building here next to it. You see there are two modern buildings there, okay? Uh, in any case, what I'm looking 
at is that extension here in the front. This extension here is, in a way, a connector. So again, you have an older body uh, in architect, I mean, with the, uh, and, and here it's Cafiero who builds the old part, Ridolfi who builds the new part, the connector, and here in this connector is this very, very ugly, it's hideous, I mean, really, most, I have to say, of it is not, very attractive, but in any case, uh, this uh, this new room, which is a meeting room, here it is, even uglier, okay, with a lot of people sitting here, but here's the ceiling, that's what they gave me, that's what I received from FAO when I published my book. But okay, so you see again, you have a big uh, fascist building, massive, you build a connector, and also the repurposing, uh, it was the Ministry of Colonies, colonies, Italian colonies in Africa that becomes now the goody-goody organization of FAO, which also works in the third world and does exactly the opposite. So it's the, the colonial thing that becomes the post-colonial thing, right? Or the, the decolonization. I mean, FAO is very much about decolonization. Okay? So you, re you, you the, the new function of the building and here the celestial vault. Uh, this is by uh, an artist called... Um, in this case here, uh, Mirko uh, Basaldella. Mirko also sounds actually like um, a Yugoslavian name, but in fact he's Italian. And he paints this plaster relief uh, depicting a celestial vault, glittering blue shades of ochre and gold. What is interesting is that it's detached. They're interesting in detaching things. Now, this idea of a detached ceiling is anathema to fascism. Fascism is about walls. It's about solidity. And synthesis is very much about decorated walls. There are almost no ceilings decorated under fascism. And here, very clearly, you have this kind of modern, I mean, you see, it's a 50s, very much about engineering. It actually looks almost like Luigi Nervi. And on top of it, semi-detached. And the semi-detachment, I think, is uh, key here. Why? Because if you think that in 1939, Joe Ponti, again, always in Domus, is calling still in 1939 for mural painting. Just as he, like a few weeks before the, end, before the beginning of the war, he says in elementary uh, considerations on mural painting, he says, I quote, uh, that you know, one has to encourage artists to still paint murals. Painting needs to celebrate, evoke, document something. It needs to have an aim. It has a responsibility. It will not be vacuous and vain. I, it will not be abstract, right? It will be figurative. It will fit, it will fill its environment on the four walls. Mural painting is that, he says, which cleaves to the function of walls. It needs to adhere to the function of wall. There are four walls and they go from floor to ceiling. Mural painting has to occupy those walls entirely. End of quote. So, and he takes as an example, okay, uh, this is obviously uh, Ferrara. All right, so back to Italian, you know, Renaissance painting and a call to mural painting. So this is basically what happens after. We move to the ceiling, the flight from the wall to the ceiling, which becomes a tectonic and becomes then this kind of uh, Baroque idea, uh, or neo neo barocchetto or whatever you want to call it, but it's a tectonic. Another example of more of the same, another immense building, the most massive instance of a fascist pro uh, project being completed and decorated after uh, the war. This is the Farnesina, built along the Tiber towards the northeast part of the city. It's now the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So again, a building that was meant to be the, one of the headquarters of the fascist regime, one of the Palazzo del Littorio, one of the numbers of Palazzi del Littorio, which then becomes, and you know, this is happening in Eastern Europe all the time, uh, right, uh, the refurbishing, repurposing uh, of this building. Uh, they start planning it in 34, series of designs are made in 38, 39, in a bombastic uh, Piacentinian style. Piacentini, um, it's traditionalist, it's, uh, it's truly, and closest actually to Nazi uh, uh, prototypes at the time of an Italian-German rapprochement in the late 30s. So this is a project very much 
much of 3839, as, mm, as immense as can be. What is it? It's next to a uh, sport complex, the Foro Mussolini, by the same architect, Eduardo del Debbio. And here I'm showing you part. So this is 35, right, with the sculptures of the athletes around it. Very large, the Foro Mussolini expands along the Tiber, and then this continuation here. Um, all right. Now, the name Farnesina is also a envoi to another Farnesina, a much smaller and more beautiful building, uh, you know, frescoed by, uh, in particular by Raphael. I'm showing it to you. It's also along the Tiber. And in fact, underneath it are also Roman frescoes. So Farnesina is, in a way, related to the idea of decoration as a term. Uh, and there is Villa Farnesina and La Farnesina. So the Italians understand when you say La Farnesina, you mean this humongous thing, and Villa Farnesina, you mean this. What is interesting here, and I realized this as I was reading about the Farnesina, and there's a new book that came on, out on it, but one thing that they never tell us is that there was a conference that took place at La Farnesina in 1936, which was the big conference organized under the fascist regime, the Convegno Volta, uh, because the Farnesina is in front of the Accademia dei Lincei, uh, and the uh, Volta, uh, in honor of Volta, you know, the inventor of uh, electricity, of the batteries. Uh, this was a conference on the relation between architecture and the figurative arts, sponsored in 36 by the arch-fascist Reale Accademia d'Italia, which is meant, obviously, to say to the world, uh, they invited Germans, and, and they invite Le Corbusier. You see Le Corbusier in the front on the left. And the idea, of course, was that the idea here, there, yes, in this frescoed room, that Le Corbusier, they knew that there would be a confrontation between Le Corbusier and Piacentini, where Le Corbusier says, you know, forget old, uh, you know, Romanita frescoes. Let's explode the wall by painting them in a mono by, you know, Le Corbusier believed actually in monochromatic walls. But nevertheless, there is a renvoi. And I'm interested in these kind of ideas that when you hear Farnesina, what is it sending you back to? It's sending you, of course, all men, all middle-aged men, I mean, deadly. Uh, and I had to go through all of these uh, papers at the conference. Okay, so we have this. But then there is, again, you see how enormous it is, right? It's immense, and it truly looks, uh, I mean, this is uh, yeah, it's as immense a building as can be. Here we have Del Debio designing in 59 those, and so it's late, it's 58, 59. By then there was a big debate in the Italian press, like why are we even spending money on completing some horrendous megalomaniac buildings of that type? But in fact, Italy completes those buildings. You know, in Germany they're bombed, in Italy there is a post-fascist moment when such buildings are completed. So it is completed. This guy Del Debio, who is a rather traditionalist architect, you see has these very finished, very academic renderings. And he knows exactly what he wants, uh, even though uh, he still doesn't do it himself. He asks uh, sculptors and architects, not uh, sculptors and painters, not very well known, uh, a man called Francesco Coccia, Amerigo Tot again, and Pietro Cascella to decorate these big rooms in this, this looks almost neo-orientalist, right? So here are those rooms. This is, uh, it's in color, but it's okay. This is a, uh, a ceiling. Again, you see, suspended. They're always contro soffitto, dropped false ceilings, none of them structurals, that declare themselves as sculptural ornaments, or what you call plastica ornamentale. This is coccia, yes, dropped ceiling there. And these are in these big rooms on the first floor, in a scraffito, but of course it also looks a little, it looks neo-oriental, right? It has a kind of a musharabia. Uh, quality to it. It's a Mediterranean motif. It's graffito meets uh, musharabia. Uh, and um, yes, I mean, very much so. This, except that it's suspended like this, still comes out, though, of a fascist idea of synthesis of the arts, in the sense that it's the response to a law of 2%. It was called the French La Loi du 1%, 2%. I don't know if they had the same thing in the Soviet Union, where 2% of the money spent on a building had to be spent on its 
Decoration. The law was passed in 1949, but it was ideated back in 1936 by the then fascist minister of culture, Giuseppe Bottai. So it shows that, of course, in Italy everything takes forever. So 36, it's ideated, 49, it comes into, and it's a response to this, as is everything else that I've shown you until now. So you have this, you have these, I mean, Yes, uh, this Amerigo Totti or gilded wood to imitate metal. Uh, this is a uh, hall of victory. I mean, yes, in that sense, you could say it's an undoing of synthesis, but it's also a neo-fascist style because look at the use of marble uh, for the building. Look at the proportions. Um, and this is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So in that sense, uh, you know, these are very symbolic buildings, but not often visited, I guess, except for <laughs> diplomats. Uh, all right, another one here, ceramic, maiolica. I'll say one thing. The idea is that you never use marble, right, materials. So it has to be poor materials. So you have wood, plaster, and maiolica. And as you know, the 50s is the big moment of ceramics. Again, in this kind of, somebody should be doing it's not going to be me, but it's interesting that there is a kind of a neo-orientalist look also to this. It's like supra-decorative by being neo-orientalist. Uh, and that this is actually not the style that we find at FAO. All right. Now, if we go to Milan, suddenly we're in a completely different thing. The synthesis of the arts finds its calling in much more prosaic sites in buildings, like normal buildings, office buildings, what the Italians call palazzina, which are undistinguished middle class, upper middle class buildings. Uh, some people said that they wish that there had been decorative art decoration added on buildings uh, to make them, you know, colorful, less, uh, you know, to somehow again humanize uh, uh, modernist architecture. There was a hope that this would happen in um, proletarian neighborhoods. It doesn't. It's really in the center of Milan in bourgeois, rather rich neighborhoods. Uh, and as you know, Milan, if you've been, it's particularly gray. It's hard to imagine that Milan is even an Italian city. It's one of the grayest cities in the world. It makes Moscow look uh, happy. Uh, in any case, so here we are. So Fontana, a rather well-known artist, right? Lucio Fontana, as you know, works. He's a, both a sculptor, a painter. He does this thing here in 4750 in the center of Milan. Names of architects not very famous. Marco Zanuso is a more well-known architect, and he's also a furniture designer. Italy by then, already architects, one of the things of synthesis of the arts in Italy, as you probably know, and I talk about it a little bit in my book, but not here, is the connection with design. Design is one of the ways in which synthesis will take place in the 60s, in the 50s. And Marco Zannuso, also there is no design school. They, all the designers are in fact architects. Uh, and again, Domus plays a very important role in this. So Marco Zannuso is an architect and a furniture designer, they give, okay, so what is interesting here is that there's almost invisible. You walk past Via del Senato, you're in the center, they're behind glass because they're made out of this very brittle material, gray, that almost wants to disappear. It's, so the idea is that these are, in Milan, things that are almost invisible. The, it's like decoration that is not only superfluous, but almost invisible. So here, and these are these marvelous door handles that he makes. So the first thing that you do when you come in is that you touch this inform, a squid uh, thing, right? He uses ceramic in, we were talking this morning with uh, a student about the idea of using ceramic in a very anti-academic way uh, to de-skill ceramic or to use it in this kind. So it's, it's obviously got a little surrealist touch. And there are six of those. And so there are only little touches in places that are unexpected here, there. This is more unexpected. Um, so here you have the cold metal and that squid that you touch, right? That cold squid. So you think that that squid-like shape is going to be hard, but it's soft. That kind of neo-neo art nouveau, which of course is again anti-fascist because it has that inform quality in it, which the Baroque has as well. If you think of Baroque with a small B, not with a big B. And here are more of those. So Domus, okay, looking at this. Giovanni Dova is a spazialista. He's part of a member of uh, that movement of uh, abstract artists in, uh, okay. 
Um, and here it's in ceramic, which is a poor material, like uh, tiles, uh, like bathroom tiles. And this is in a rather working class neighborhood. Uh, it's quite unique though, in that sense. And you see again, always done in this kind of playful way, which is all about discontinuity, right? Uh, it's playful, discontinuous. More here is um, Fontana uh, on another street, uh, Via Lanzone 3. Uh, I don't even know the name of the architect here. This is a completely banal palazzina. He creates, you see these things, and you see that they're added. You really see the details. They are semi-detached. They are bracketed. In fact, I have like details of the large bracket. I became very interested in those details of these, uh, and they're staggered, right? So everything is asymmetrical and playful, and at the same time, kind of hideous, right? Because it has that kind of cobra uh, quality, right? Like, like a cobra painting. It's, you see that it looks like if it's broken, but it's not. It's very dry, brittle, abstract, organic forms uh, on those. But basically, you walk through those streets of Milan and you don't even notice them unless you're looking for them. And one more here. Uh, this is a Crippa. Via Canova, uh, there's a few of them on that one street, and it's interesting because this is a street that is very close to the Triennale, the garden of the Triennale. And the Triennale, you know, is a place where artists are going from all over the world to show design, and so it's a, it's a neighborhood for that. Again, uh, this is all um, ceramic, so you can, and you know, the 50s is ceramic. It's like almost the material of the mid-century. Uh, and this is a, um, yes, Roberto Crippa is another uh, spazialista. Uh, okay, so what we could say uh, and I want to get to the second half of my lecture, but I'll show you one more example. If we think of it in terms of what I call the logic of the paragon, I say that everything here, the interventions on the part of the artists are intended to look as if added on, eccentric. They thus play the role that Derrida uh, called in his well-known discussion of the framing modalities of the definition of the work of art in Kant, the paragon. Okay, as a chapter on the paragon in Truth in Painting, which is basically a critique of Kant. He says that the paragon is an element that may appear at first to be peripheral or superfluous, marginal as decoration or ornament, and here I use both, actually, I know some people don't use both, but here I wanna use both, uh, but in fact is integral to the work. It is, in fact, integral to the ergon. That is, it tells us something about the ergon, and that is that what it's telling us here is that synthesis, the idea of unity, which is so fundamental to synthesis, is something precisely that these artists want to undo. So this is then Derrida talks about, he says this is not merely in fact a supplement, but a dangerous supplement that allows us to see, that gives us to see, or that causes to be seen something essential about the work itself, about the ergon itself, namely its lack. It's interesting now because I suddenly realize that uh, Dorazio, in that quote that I gave you, says it's not a lack in architecture. But in fact, it tells you, yes, it is a lack. Uh, but that lack, you know, that absence is precisely what is interesting. Uh, so Derrida would probably go to Adoratio text if he said, oh my God, you're talking about lack, because in fact, you're afraid to show a lack in architecture. But the lack is precisely what this is, which is to play with the idea that architecture, that rationalism somehow is not that is something that can be revisited in a playful way, and that it will reveal uh, the lack of rationalism, that is the lack of humanity in rationalism, or the lack of playfulness in rationalism. So there's something subversive, okay? So it's not, the, it's not a complement, it's a supplement. It makes up, it supplies for something, and it even says that he would like to replace it. So there is something, you know, as we said, that little detail, which is a nothing detail, is saying something about the overall building. 
Okay, now let's look at one last example here in Milan, uh, also on Via Canova, uh, also almost in, and you, know, in every, you can't see it, right? Because here the ornament, again, is under the balconies, okay? So it's the most invisible part, but at the same time, it's exactly the kind of thing that you see from the street. And I realized that in Milan, in fact, there are Art Nouveau buildings which have decoration under the terrace, because I loved it. I mean, you know, it's called Sotto Balcone, because I went to see, the, it's done by this artist called Pomodoro. Uh, there are two brothers, this is Arnaldo, and he's also a specialist, he's a sculptor, and he also does jewelry. He's a bit like, uh, he's a less talented uh, Fontana. Uh, and it's wonderful, because you see that each one of the balconies is different. So they're like paintings, in a way, or like low reliefs, they're framed. Each one of them is different. You can read them, in a way, as you know, lunar landscapes, sunken cities. They're, again, with this idea of the graffito. And what interested me here, again, is this desire for disappearance of ornament by 58-59, that it's done in cement. Uh, it looks as if it were done at the same time as the building, but in fact, they were added after. But the effect is that it's as if it were done at the same time as the building in wet cement, uh, it, concrete, right? And which is very much a non-decorative, uh, and it's gray on gray. Uh, so the desire, as I said, for disappearance. And they are, in fact, precast. And what he did, I'll show you another detail here, you see? Some of them, he would use ossi di seppia, uh, which are cuttlefish bones, which are also, it's the title of um, a, a poetry by uh, Eugenio Montale, who got a Nobel Prize during those years, uh, called ossi di seppia. And I think, again, there is, as you know, in the 50s, this attraction for graffito, for um, forms that are natural, but, you know, on the verge of disappearance. And also, you see how they're placed in these weird, so I love this building, <laughs> it's a wonderful building. Also because you see it uses white brick, so everything is completely cheap, right? Uh, even though it's in actually a rather expensive neighborhood. And here again, you see it runs up the little pilasters, boom, 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 up. Uh, they gather almost like mud, right, uh, on those pilasters. They articulate the building. So again, I became interested in looking at these nothing things, basically, and how these nothing things can be made interesting, uh, ideally. And here, each you see a little... Um, Petty, I mean, I would call it, it's a frieze on over a pilaster, uh, looks uh, different. So again, pittura informale, spazialismo, materismo. Materismo, which is a key term, again, the interest in matter, materism in French, so that's all over Europe at that point. Cement, concrete, allowing sculptures to summon up, in a way, uh, you know, uh, temporality, which it's, it's both very, very modern, and at the same time, it looks like it's decaying. So it's a, um, an aesthetic of decay and an aesthetic of engineering at the same time, civil engineering and decay. And uh, all right, I'm going to show you one more. Oh, yeah, I love this. This is the, the, uh, the box, uh, you know, the, the mailboxes. You see, so he adds these little freezes in all sorts of places. Again, it's interesting in terms of undecipherability. So when I published, I did a little article with this thing, and I did this pun on the mail in Italy, you know, which never arrives. Uh, and uh, the undecipherability of this little freeze, right, and the writing underneath it. Uh, and again, of course, always combined with glass and with metal. All right, so these, yeah, uh, this, yeah, this is, so there's like eight floors. So palazzina, generally, when it's used in Italian, it really means like ugly, right? I mean, it's like, oh, you know, who wants to work on palazzina? But in fact, it turns out that there are that there are books on the history of the Palazzina in Italy in the 50s, which has very much to do with reconstruction. Milan was much more bombed than Rome. You know, Rome was preserved, except for the neighborhood of San Lorenzo, uh, proletarian neighborhood, uh, easily bombed, right? Uh, no monuments there, although there were some. Here, Milan was bombed in the city center, and there are many, many parts of Milan. It was one of the most... Uh, of the Allies, it was one of the few bombed cities with uh, London, okay? Uh, bombed by the Allies, of course, because it was still occupied by the retreating German troops. So from 43 to 44, uh, 
Milan is bombed. And a lot of these things were built uh, in areas that had been bombed. And in that sense, it's like London. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears to something very different, but I hope that you can see the connection. And I'm moving to Como, okay, near Milan. And I'm moving to an event that I'm visiting through a photo book, in fact, through something small, and I'm revisiting it through photography, really, truly through photographs. This is the third chapter of this book I'm finishing now, no, not the third, the second chapter. I, it used to be the third, now it became the second. Uh, and it's a one-day event that takes place mostly around the square in Como, which is the main square with the Duomo, uh, late medieval Renaissance in a medieval style. You'll see it's also got, you'll see a Baroque dome that will become important for me in the back. And then on the left, medieval town hall, uh, which is no longer the town hall at that time, but was the town hall, the broletto. Uh, and, you know, so it looks like, well, not this, a bit like the center of Tallinn. Okay, the main spec. Okay, it takes place all over the city, but for reasons of time, I'm going to focus on some of the actions that happened in the middle. So what is unusual about this is that I'm visiting it through a very spectacular photo book, uh, photographs by a man called Ugo Mulas, and the book was designed by a man called Bruno Munari, Bruno Munari was the most avant-garde designer under fascism. He did uh, very extraordinary photomontage. Etc. When they take over the city of Como and part of its lake for a series of interventions, actions that last one, from the early afternoon into the night of one day, September 21, 1969. So this is the kind of thing that a lot of us are familiar with. It becomes a derive that situationist, neo-situationist derive is photographed, something that the situationists would never want to do. And so thus I am dealing with an artwork which is, in a way, those photographs. Um, when I do it in the book, I'm more interested in flashbacks than here. Here, what interests me is something else. It's how everything that happens in the streets around the Duomo, north of the Duomo, eclipses this building here that, of course, architecture historians know very well. It's the most famous building built under fascism by a modernist rationalist architecture, Giuseppe Terragni, the Casa del Fascio. I say eclipsed because, as you'll see, I'm interested in a number of works that really, you see that, in fact, when they move around the city, they are moving around there. And in fact, you see that there is that street and that street where you could very easily see the Casa del Fascio, but yet they make sure to eclipse it. That is, they make sure not to go there. And why? Because in 69, they say they don't want to revisit it, but in fact, as I'll show you, they are revisiting it in an indirect way. So. Uh, the Casa del Fascio is also synthesis of the arts inside. So in a way, this is the perfect example of the modernist synthesis, which is avoided by artists uh, in uh, 69. So I say clips. Now, what is a flashback, just for a moment? We all know what a flashback is, right? It's used in cinema. It's a moment of the past that intervenes in the present flow of narrative. Flashbacks are often used to recount events that happened before the story's primary sequence of events to fill a crucial backstory. In movies and in television, several camera techniques and special effects have been employed to alert the viewer that the action is taking place in the past. Uh, black and white, for instance, blurred pictures, f uh, chopped photography. So some of this happens actually in that photo book. And I'm interested in that. Another thing which is more original, perhaps, is that I use this concept of eclipse, which is my second model, which includes, yes, the alignment of, as we know, an eclipse is when the moon passes in front of the sun or the sun in front of the moon, and they hide the thing behind it. I'm interested in the fact that the eclipse is often, often, since time immemorial, been regarded as a bad omen. It's a bad thing, it's a dark thing. And also that the eclipse is something very difficult to photograph, and photographers were very interested in photographing eclipses because of that. And also that the eclipse mimics, in cosmic term, the movement of a camera shutter, opening and closing as it captures its object. So in a way, the eclipse can be said to turn the world into an image-making apparatus. And this is one of the key uh, topics of my current book, uh, that uh, the eclipse makes everything look like if it's 
an apparatus. And we will see that both the Casa del Fascio and one of the works that I want to look at now that was done there function as apparatuses. And in fact, I think they function as what I call memory machines. All right. So both flashback and eclipse then are best captured by the camera. And I will be looking at that book here, this uh, book, which is like 100 pages. We will look only at few of them. You see here. So it, the, the, these artists were gathered by an architecture historian who is also an art historian who worked uh, a lot actually on the Casa del Fascio and on uh, abstract art during the fascist regime, but after the regime. He's a rather young man here. Uh, so Hugo uh, Luciano Caramel, who uh, would say he's in his, uh, well, not young, I mean he's in his 40s uh, in 69. Hugo Mulas, who dies in 73, who is known in Italy for is uh, mostly photographing the Venice Biennales, and anybody who's working on the Biennale, all the photographs you're looking at are by Hugo Mulas. And then Bruno Munari, who is older. So yeah, collaboration between an architecture historian, a photographer, and a designer, uh, who is also sometimes a painter. And also different generations. Luciano Caramel in his 40s, Hugo Mulas uh, a bit younger, and he will die very very young in 73, and Munari, who could be the father of those two, okay, and they work together. And this is the covers. Uh, I own the book, I destroyed it, of course, to, for these lectures, but that's the way it is. Uh, it was published, uh, there's only, you know, a few hundred, uh, okay, and they, okay, so it comes out of this as well. Uh, Hugo Mulas was actually the person who pho photographed uh, what happened at the Venice Biennale, where we also have happenings, you know, as you know, those demonstrations uh, all over Italy, all over Europe in 68, and before that, including, of course, Czechoslovakia, uh, are taking place. So in a way, you could say that Campo Urbano is kind of revisiting that, and it's an artistic, you could even say that it mimics it. These, um, what the Italians call movimenti di piazze, when people move around squares, but also the fact that Mulas is photographing the way you have demonstrations in relation to art events. So the Triennale in 68, the Biennale, and that already is a special type of demonstration, which is almost like a happening. Here you have a political demonstration, but it's not it's already also mostly students, so it's workers, students, artists, and then things like Campo Urbano, which are a niche within art that somehow uh, both mimics, or you could say is also a model for uh, a kind of a political artistic intervention, okay? And here, of course, uh, Via la Polizia della Biennale, pop art, equal, equal blitz, you know, it, it's an acute, also anti-pop, anti-American, anti-Vietnam, all these things. Okay, now, let me look at the book for a few minutes and also deal with this question of what happens with the Casa del Fascio. Uh, I will look at a few little events here, okay? Uh, so Campo Urbano, it's, uh, you saw uh, its full name is Interventi Estetici nella Dimensione Collettiva Urbana, which means aesthetic interventions in the collective urban dimension. Uh, so he invites these artists and they do these things. Some of them are from Como, others from Milan. There's also a few of them from other parts of Italy and they come just for a few hours. Uh, here is uh, one of the ones that, you know, he asks, so how come everybody has chosen the main piazza? And he hangs dirty laundry. His name is Gianni Pettena. And here the idea, of course, is that uh, you are going to wash your dirty laundry in public uh, by hanging, uh, you know, the dirty laundry in front of the Duomo. Um, so it's about basically bringing the reality of working class Italian periphery, you know, always the picturesque idea of the South also where uh, the, the dirty laundry or the clean laundry hangs and bringing it onto the square. It's also about the idea that in Italy, of course, there is constant deregulation in a country that is known for observing very few rules. So it's about deregulation at the same time as, as you know, when you organize an event like this, the artists and this man, uh, uh, 
Caramel had to go to the municipality, the tourist agency, the Chamber of Commerce, and other institutions to ask for permission. This guy does not ask for permission, and he's not even invited by Caramel. So he just comes and he even does to the artists what the artists do to the institution, which is to just show up. And here is those photographs. This is the book. You see it's open like this, and you see this beauty, the way it either repeats the same photograph, some photographs you will see are tilted sideways, because in a way the idea is to reproduce the sense of one uh, photographer running around different parts of the city with one camera one day to photograph different events happening, sometimes in succession, but sometimes at the same time. So this is the first event. Another event would be this, Segnaletica Horizontale. This is an artist who earlier on used to be a painter, a spazialista, um, no, a nucleare, Umbe Enrico Baj. And he, in a way, what he does is that he simulates a political coup. He also paints, uh, okay, Colpo di Stato. You see that he's very interested, uh, Mulas, in photographing the public, the reaction of the public. And here they paint on the floor the tricolor flag. Uh, and they uh, and all of this is happening under the dirty under the laundry layer and also you have uh, a orchestra playing uh, a mock military tune so there is here the sense that this is about the military, that it's also about, at that point in Italy, you have, as I said, anti-Vietnam demonstrations everywhere. You also have anti, uh, um, you have demonstrations really basically in allegiance also in solidarity with the French, uh, with the students uh, in Paris. And this is also making reference to that at the same time as it's making reference clearly through the way the crowd is somewhat regimented to uh, uh, you know, earlier types of adunate, as they were called under uh, fascism. More, this is Bruno Munari visualizing, so he's throwing these little bits of papers from the top of the, 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 the broletto. And here you have these photographs showing their dissemination on the floor. So every half hour you have another thing. And you see here, this is the one that interests me most, and I will spend a little bit on time on it at the end of this talk. This is by Mario Di Salvo and Carlo Ferrario. Ferrario is a uh, musician, Di Salvo is an architect, and it is called Riflessioni. So what they did is that they put around the Duomo those mirrors, not all around precisely, in the front and one side, and people are looking, and what it does of course is that destabilizes uh, the most famous uh, monument in um, in Como. Uh, it does it just for an hour, for, for an afternoon, uh, and it uh, unhinges it uh, in um, myriad refractions. And here is Mulas photographing them. You know the photo, and you see Mulas photographing himself. Uh, here more, and here you see that in fact there is this uh, from these kind of mock. These are fake um, cement. Um, baptismal fountain, a tape recorder is concealed behind a mirror in a cement well shaped in a baptismal, as a baptismal font and it emits fragments of music and almost inaudible political slogans recorded during a recent street demonstration. So you have the uh, music dimension, the sound uh, dimension mixed with uh, political speeches, okay, so it's always word, uh, politically loaded uh, speeches uh, mixed with uh, sound. Uh, and another uh, thing like this, for instance, Valentina Bernardinone, here is her anti-monumentino. So every, sorry, you unveil a monument, there is always these little local orchestra playing around. Um, and uh, I'm showing them to you quite fast here. Yes, that's that kind of, you see that as a slapstick touch. Uh, she painted red drops of blood running down the side of her monument. And it's Alla Vittoria, right? So it's all this anti-military, uh, this has got a little pop touch. And again, you see, I'm showing them to you as they appear in the photo book. And also that um, erasure, those kind of false erasures as he's uh, bluing, you know, he's immersing the, 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 the photograph in uh, different 
products that creates that sense of erasure, so that you have again that sense of the movement and the incompleteness. So this, every event is like a sec, uh, three uh, sets of photographs, right? Three pages, in fact, six photographs. Another one, he's an architect, Ugo La Pietra. I uh, cover a street and I invent another. This is the main street uh, in Como, the main commercial, commercial street in the center of Como. And you see, you can't shop, obviously. You're like in there, you know, he covers it with these uh, sacks, um, actually with a plastic, uh, black plastic to block the pedestrian's view of the street shop windows. Uh, more here, uh, right, so you pass underneath uh, those, uh, you see some of it is done like this, others are cut. Uh, here on the left, it looks almost like neorealist cinema, and I'm interested in those kind of flashbacks to images that seem to relate to neorealist cinema. So this is uh, the anti-commercial, right? So you have anti-commercial, anti-capitalist, anti-war, all the ingredients. This is uh, nine, at 6.30, an intermezzo. It's called Playing the City, Suonando la Città. So in fact, what they do, this is a uh, Giuseppe Chiari and Franca Sacchi. She's a singer, he's a musician. He is a composer from Florence who was connected to uh, the uh, Italian uh, branch of Fluxus and the mezzo-soprano Franca they stretched electric wires down from the windows of the Broletto, uh, the town hall, across the piazza to produce a gigantic harp, harp, right, like a harpsichord. They connected these wires to microphones and loudspeakers, and the sound installation in cloud included car sirens, two dishwashers, and a blender. That's all very Cajun, right? So two dishwashers, a blender, car sirens. And then they invite people, uh, they distribute whistles and tambourines and harmonicas to the public and to children. This was the most popular event. And the Komaski, right, the inhabitants of Como, are invited to play quite literally their city. So the building becomes this instrument. Uh, and here you have all these uh, then photographs at the center of the book about this event, okay? Now, at, at night, and I'll show you just one or two more uh, examples, this is reserved for uh, members of um, collectives from Milan, Gruppo N, Gruppo T. These are 60s artists that worked in collectives. And here I'm showing you just one example from what happens at night. This is members, they're disbanded at this point. They don't exist anymore, so they reconnect. Here are their names, Davide Boriani, Gianni Colombo, uh, Giuseppe, uh, Gabriele De Vecchi. One of them only is alive. Uh, the other ones are dead, so I could interview one of them. I interviewed, of course, that's what happens, right? At this point, you interview artists. For the first time I was working on people who are still alive. Tempo libero, strutturazione temporale di uno spazio urbano. What they did here, it's almost incomprehensible from these photographs. They decided to designate a special perimeter of the Piazza del Duomo. Again, I'm focusing on those. At 9.15 at night uh, for this tempo libero. The title plays on the word temporale, which means in Italian both temporal, in terms of time, and rainstorm. Here they enlisted the firemen and electricians to commandeer the city's hydrants, you know, that produce water, producing an artificial storm, while loudspeakers emitted taped sounds of falling rain, and projectors cast bluish green lights, interrupted by flashes to simulate lightning, and they, the lightning strikes the wet pavement. It's a synchronized action that lasts only 15 minutes. So in that sense, this is much more, it's also what you call in Italy arte programmata. It's programmed to last just a certain amount of time. And in fact, it's very close to one particular uh, situationist uh, event that never took place, uh, that was planned. So they were reading Situationist magazines, and in a way, often they did things that are not reprise, but things that were not done elsewhere that they do. And I'm interested in that too, that you revisit the past and do the things that are not done elsewhere, and you, in a way, reenact them. Okay, but my last point, and the point that connects all of this to what I wanted to say about the first part of this lecture, and here, yes, this is another part of this event here and here. Okay, this figure crossing, uh, which in the book I relate to actually a 
the sculpture, the monument to Giordano Bruno in Rome. It becomes very crazy and very Warburgian, and I won't take you there. But okay, here is the end of the event with other actions. This is one I didn't show you. Okay, leftovers in front of the... Uh, Again, we don't want to go there, but as always with uh, actions like this, uh, you have this whole reactions. And I was interested in the work of my colleague, uh, Claire Bishop, because Claire, in her book called Artificial Health, she looks at a lot of participation, and uh, that, that's the topic of her book. And this whole question of when is a participation, um, when an action, when an event uh, is a failure or a... Uh, a success, and it's very hard to tell what is failure and what is success. Here, Como journals, all the local, the more local the journalists, the more against this they are. It's, oh, we've seen it all over, we've seen it, it's neo-data, and it's because, in fact, they're being very defensive and provincial. Then you have some people who say, no, this is actually very interesting, which are actually more the journalists from Milan. In any case, so there's all this stuff around this event, which I got interested in. But what really interests me here for today and is the fact that they avoid this building. And that this building, as you can see from my photographs, I went to Como, I looked. I mean, it's two minutes, right? You can see it all the time. So clearly here, you see that there are two minutes from there. Here you see that they obviously avoid, they stray away from it. This is the most famous monument of their city. The famous monument is not the Duomo, there's a Duomo in every Italian city. There's no uh, Terrani Casa del Fascio in every uh, uh, city. I won't describe it to you now, but as you know, it's truly one of the most spectacular rationalist uh, buildings um, and also extremely, you know, it's, it's, it's Corbusian in a way, but you see it's got that blank. There was a big discussion about what to do if I mean, Terrani wanted to keep it blank like this. Uh, it's very much about the glass doors uh, with parades uh, opening. It's Piazza dell'Impero. It's outside, I have to say, what is interesting is that you see it's just outside of the city wall. In fact, the city wall, you see it, right? It's that road there. So at that time, you didn't have that big road, you had a wall, but this is the Piazza del Impero. Of course, now it has another name. And typically, of course, the Casa del Fascio now became something else. It's where you go to pay taxes, actually, so it's not such a nice place, but, well, you have to pay taxes, right? Okay, even in Italy. So, uh, okay, uh, so this is what interested me, that it all happened, you know, uh, except there. And I tried to figure out why, and uh, especially that since when I interviewed Caramel, he said to me, oh, we did didn't care, it was irrelevant at the time. I said, oh really, it was irrelevant. Well, okay, it just turns out though, as Caramel was telling me that it was irrelevant, that Caramel and Di Salvo and Ico Parisi, who is another uh, participant, in fact, uh, participated at a mega conference, which was the first conference in, about Terrani, the first important conference on Terrani in Italy in 68, and it's interesting that precisely in 68, at the time when you have the student movements, etc., they're revisiting the heritage of this mega fascist modernist architect, and the whole question of whether is he a modernist, is he a fascist, can you be a fascist modernist? This is the conference, uh, it was uh, there in Como, uh, and it was run by Bruno Zevi, who was at the time the most important architecture historian, pre- uh, well, what comes after pre uh, other things. So Bruno Zevi here, Omaggio a Terrani, you see with that. And here on the left, I was interested in this journal called Quadrante Lariano, because as I said, Di Salvo, who did that beautiful uh, piece here that uh, is uh, the one with the mirrors, right? This one is uh, speaking at both, uh, both writing on Terrani and Terrani's heritage and speaking at this conference. And so is Caramel. So, you know, why is it that they want to avoid? Well, they want to avoid because basically this is a day which is supposed to be avant-garde. So you have two lives. You have the life of the architecture historian and the historian who is interested in preservation. And in fact, Di Salvo then worked on the restoration of a number because, you know, Terrani builds all over Como. He's from Milan, but he's basically has his office in Como and his footprint is all over Como. And so I was interested in this. And I was interested in the fact that, of course, Caramel, uh, 
subsequently writes about this room. This room is destroyed uh, today because what do we have? We have uh, Mario Radice, who is a uh, abstract artist from Como, who uh, paints one of the most spectacular murals under the fascist regime because it's abstract, which is very rare. But of course, okay, so it looks like the style, it looks like Bauhaus. Uh, Terrani designs the chairs, he designs the table, yeah, and uh, Mario uh, Radice, Radice actually, uh, does this. And of course, in the middle, you have this, uh, the, the, this photo uh, mural, uh, which looks almost, in fact, uh, constructivist of the Duce. Now, this had to be destroyed, but of course the building is still there. And in fact, it looks like all of the abstract work here is nothing but a frame for the Duce. So, all right. It turns out, as I said, that Caramel is the expert on Radice, and then he also does the catalogue raisonné. Another thing that interested me is this, 6836. This is the most famous issue of Quadrante, which was the most important architecture magazine, radical architecture magazine, and also one of the most fascist, okay? So it's rationalist supra-fascist. Uh, it is uh, edited uh, by, um, uh, now I'm blanking out, but of course you know by whom, uh, okay, uh, Mario bon, uh, okay, Bontempelli and uh, Pier Maria Bardi. You know how people are working now a lot on Bobardi, uh, the uh, woman architect in um, uh, Bobardi who uh, worked in, uh, who lived in, um, in Rio de Janeiro. Well, she was married, in fact, to this supra older fascist, ex fascist man before they emigrated to uh, Brazil. Uh, and uh, this is Bardi. Okay, look at this 68, May 68, okay, just as what's happening in Paris is happening, there is a reprise of this. So they are doing a reprise, right? You're revisiting the past, but you're doing the opposite, black, white. And I analyzed these two covers. Ah, oh, here he is, Pier Maria Bardi and Massimo Bontempelli, direttori. Okay, this is the eclipse. This is the lunar eclipse. This is the solar eclipse. And so I do a whole reading of how one image passes in front of the other and eclipses it in order to do precisely what I say this event does, which is to eclipse at the same time as you flash back. You revisit and you eclipse at the same time something that happened before. Here is the pages by Ternani. He designs this photo mural, this uh, collage there. Uh, where he shows, well, it's not really a collage, but it's the idea of, is that you have one, two, right, next to one another. Medioevo, Rinascimento, Tempi Nostri. One will substitute, uh, well, it's not se situera cela, actually. It's one, two, three. It's a lineup of buildings where, yes, the Casa del Fascio will substitute for the Duomo, which substituted for the the torre, but the three coexist. And here you see on the right how uh, the uh, photo murals uh, or photographs that there was this discussion about, and, and the idea of the use of photomontage. So I was interested in all of this because Munari knows all this and he is designing. So all the people are participating in this. They know exactly what happened and yet they uh, want to keep away from it at a time when in the history of architecture, as in the case of Terrani, there is a beginning of serious historiographic work on fascism in 68, 69. 69 in Italy is what you call the autunno caldo. In 68, after 68, by 69 in Paris, everybody is back home. Uh, you know, a lot of students finish uh, demonstrating by the end of the summer vacation of 68, okay? They go to their country houses. Uh, that's what a lot of rather cynical people said about what happened in Paris in 68, and maybe they're right. In Italy, it continues later, and 69, in fact, is a very violent moment. And what is interesting about Campo Urbano is that it's this kind of uh, very happy moment just before it, Italy moves into uh, the years of the, um, the Red Brigades, into the years of the uh, Anni di Piombo, right? The years of lead, so that little moment. Okay, so there's this, and Terrani says in this issue, Como will be the ideal fascist city. And that is something that obviously has to be avoided if you're gonna do. Uh, so 
One thing, okay, and this is one of the other illustrations, Adunata. Okay, so here we have crowds in Como, very different kind of crowds from the crowds in Campo Urbano. Everybody knew this photograph. This is one of the most uh, reproduced photographs of the 30s, reproduced into the 60s. And another thing that is interesting here, as I stop looking at my notes here, is that here, as I'm getting back to this, Di Salvo was very interested in the way the Casa del Fascio was photographed in the 30s. And the man who does these photographs of the Casa del Fascio, which are, as I said, one of the most, uh, uh, Kenneth Frampton, I know visited here a few months ago. Kenneth Frampton is one of the first people who actually wrote about how the Casa del Fascio was photographed. He does it in a tiny, tiny article, but he was one of the first to do it. Uh, and he looks at these, which are then reproduced in 68, but they're made in 36 by Ico Parisi, who is, as I said, one of the participants in Campo Urbano. And you see how glass plays, of course, a very important role. What interests me here is the way this guy Di Salvo, when he writes, is particularly interested in the way in which Ico Parisi wants to show how the, fr the front glass, the big glass doors of the Casa del Fascio reflect the Duomo. And this idea of reflection, to me, is a form of flashback in the form of a palimpsest. Here are photographs by Parisi in Quadrante, where again and again you see, you see you have the head of Mussolini, you have, I mean, the, uh, yes, the volto, and, you know, the Duomo, being restored at the time, reflected, superimposed on the casa. Same thing here, his tables, he designs these tables, you see they're all covered with glass. And this is the photograph, the page that interests uh, Frampton. He says, oh, how interesting. You see, everything becomes an object. So he says that the Duomo is as important as the typewriter. So there is that kind of, uh, but this is again a way of doing a synthesis of the arts through photography. You have the still life, you have the photograph, you have the, uh, you know, the superimposition of a photo mural on glass, and all of this is done through the palimpsest, and it's done in the same way as that. That is, you collapse things, you unhinge buildings, and here are other photographs. Uh, this is actually in a book that came out, which is edited by um, Peter Eisenman, on more photographs of Parisi, but uh, you see again how again and again he looks at the way the uh, Duomo. So what I'm saying is why is it that this doesn't want to reflect the Casa del Fascio? The Casa del Fascio wants to reflect the Duomo. The Duomo piece in 68, 69, sorry, wants to eclipse the Casa del Fascio. So you have uh, works that function all the time, they alternate, flashback, eclipse, flashback, eclipse, flashback, eclipse, like a machine. Uh, and as I said, this question of reflection uh, and the question of crowds, how crowds behave in cities and how cities have historical memories of other crowds. And I'm going to finish here. This is Massimo Bontempelli. Look at him. He's reflected here. This is Terrani on the right, Bontempelli's wife on the left. And Bontempelli, of course, you see framed by Mussolini's uh, portrait. And so, you know, these uh, photographs speak volumes, as you can see. Uh, and what I will end up by saying, this is me photographing. You see, you can't photograph the Casa del Fascio. That's the thing. Every time you photograph, you're inside the photograph. It's all a kind of a mise en abyme of time and of space. And the Casa del Fascio then, in my little photograph, does something similar to that image here on the left. So, to conclude, of course, these mirror, this game of mirrors captured by the camera are also game of mirrors that are profoundly political, ideological. It's playful, but of course, as we said, it's very meaningful. And I'm interested in how you can fold. So you can do 36 folded on 69. In the book, I also folded on 29, which is when Warburg is in Rome doing something else. Uh, you can fold ears on one another if you have that, you know, you try to use your historical imagination. But understandably enough, in the agitated post-68 climate of the hot autumn of 1969, as I said, the authors of Riflessione, do, they sought not to reflect uh, Como's most famous and historically cumbersome 
a modernist building. It's historically cumbersome. You know, it means it's heavy, it's big, or it's so light, but it's cumbersome in terms of memory. Campo Urbano was, as contemporary reviewers concurred, a carnivalesque, dispersed, plurivocal event. It flashed back to moments of historical liberation, including Bage's fictional coup d'etat against the state, the very antithesis of the fascist rallies that took place both inside and outside of the Casa del Fascio. The organizers and the artists involved in Campo Urbano sought to eclipse the city's fascist past. If they had gone to Terragni's piazza, they would have been caught up in it. Thank you. <laughs>